uh, continue our ongoing nuclear free future conversation here in the Channel 17 studio. And my name is Margaret Harrington, and our viewers, uh, with our viewers, I'm pleased to to welcome Maggie Gunderson, who is the president of Fairwinds Energy Education, and Arnie Gunderson, who is the chief engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education. And uh, these are very interesting times, to say the least, in, in this atomic information age that we're living in. And uh, you bring things together, it, it seems to me, on your website, Fairwinds and Energy Education, where you're giving us information and updating us on, on the events of our time. And Maggie, could you start by telling us exactly what is the mission of Fairwinds Energy Education? Well, Fairwinds Energy Education, and first off, Margaret, thank you for having us on the oh, show very much. thank you for being here. So, and and yeah, we both darling. appreciate the invitation. Uh, Fairwinds Energy Education is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that its mission is to educate the public on nuclear power issues, uh, nuclear safety, nuclear reliability, and to take the jargon that the nuclear industry creates and, and use um, simple language to explain what's going on. We've done a number of videos in which Arnie has done some experiments and showed very easily what's really happening at different nuclear plants around the country and overseas. That's very important because uh, uh, I, as a member of the, the general public, am confused and dismayed by the lack of information and truth-telling about what is going on. We are almost into the full year after the March 11th triple meltdown of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And uh, it, it, it's really shocking the, that, that we are left in the dark, that we are given uh, a lot of misinformation about this. And so that the value of your service is very important right now. So uh, we're going to show a video at the end of our conversation, uh, your, one of your most recent ones. And uh, today, uh, I read that the, uh, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency from the UN, is going over to Japan to, uh, to what, Arnie? How could you explain what, they're, what they are do going to do? Well, you were, you were mentioning the, the jargon. <coughs> and um, it's like there's a, a nuclear priesthood. And, and that's been a term that's been out there for about 50 years. And, and they're trying to control the jargon and make it appear like it's too hard for the rest of us to understand. And really what we've been able to do on the site is, is show that, that, you know, that, that uh, jargon is, is just that. But there's real information in there that's being, uh, the public is not receiving. So the IAEA is, um, is um, uh, you'll see press reports saying that they're a UN watchdog agency. Um, but their, their own charter says that their role is to promote nuclear power. So they're not a watchdog at all. They're, they're a promotional branch of the nuclear power industry. Let me see. That reminds me of another agency here in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Wasn't their original uh, mission to promote nuclear power? Under the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, AEC. Yes. And um, under President Ford, the agency was split, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was formed in order to have regulation in place and have a stronger regulator and not a promoter. And the DOE is there to be the promoter. But all they did was change the sign over the door, and the same people were still there. So they continued all the same policies. So it's, it's very important to see the correlation between these two agencies. Yeah. In, in the U.S., we have um, the, the, um, the NRC has been captured. There's actually a term called regulatory capture. And the, um, over the years, they've um, uh, had more and more constraints placed upon them by Congress and the nuclear industry. So they're really, you know, certainly not a watchdog agency anymore, if they ever were. Um, but it, it's interesting, in Japan, they never made that transition. They, they, their regulator um, and the industry were, were um, controlled 
by the same agency. They actually, the, the nuclear regulator reported to the, um, called METI, and it's the, um, um, the, the, a group responsible for promoting industry within Japan. So Japan didn't even take that, that first step. I mean, we did, but then the NRC never really bought it anyway. And the IAEA um, never even acknowledged there was, um, th that they had a safety function. Immediately after the accident, the uh, chairman of the IAEA said, no, we're not a watchdog. We are not a watchdog. So they're on record as saying that. But yet now they're going to Japan, and the press is portraying it as if they are a watchdog. Um, and, and it's just not the case. It's not in their charter to, uh, to look out for nuclear safety. And their, their mission there is to, to reopen the nuclear power reactors? Well, they're opening an office. In, uh, which is a bad sign. It's the only office they've ever opened. Um, but their Outside mission... Outside of Vienna, yeah. Yeah, uh, they have a, their main office in Vienna, but this is a branch office. Um, and the Japanese government is suggesting that they're going to listen to the IAEA and do whatever the IAEA says. But again, you get to the point of saying they've been... Um, it's not in their charter to make safety um, regulations. They just don't do it. This is very disturbing. And the, the thing is that the IAEA is also the, the so-called watchdog group that has gone into Iran to check to see if, they, if, they have, if they're working on nuclear power reactors or, or nuclear bombs. Isn't that so? The, the agency yeah. has two charters. Well, on the bomb side, 92% of their staff works on bomb. 8% of their staff works on nuclear reactor oversight. And, um, uh, you know, so when they look at proliferation issues, they actually have teeth. The, the, the NRC charter for proliferation is, is relatively strong. The, the, um, the IAEA charter for, um, um, for, for nuclear power is weak. It's, we are going to promote nuclear power. So they actually have a, a, a split in the organization, 92% in favor of uh, working on uh, proliferation issues and only 8% working on nuclear power. And now in Japan, there are only a few nuclear power reactors in use, correct? There's only three that remain running. They had 54, um, and um, 10 were knocked out because of the tsunami, the, the, the four at Fukushima. Uh, Diachi and uh, uh, the four at Fukushima uh, deny, um, and they probably will never start back up. And then they had another six that were located right on an active fault, um, and those six will probably never start back up. So 16 of their 54 will probably never start back up. And then all of the others have been shut down, and in Japan, the town needs to approve the startup. And none of the towns want these things started back up. So when a plant shuts down, it can't start back up without approval of the town. The three remaining plants will shut down by April, and they'll have no nuclear power plants operating. And that's been a big controversy because the industry then went out. The, this uh, METI is the Ministry of Energy and Technology, and they went out and started saying, "Oh, we're you know this is terrible. Without nuclear power, we're not going to have any air conditioning in the summer. People are going to be sick. They're going to die. It's going to be too hot." And actually, they have a six percent surplus of power when you consider renewable sources that they have. When you consider um, water and wind and solar, and and so they do have plenty of power. And uh, this was an effort by the promoters of the nuclear industry to try and scare people in these towns and cities to approve the, the plants restarting. And the, and the NAIS, the nuclear, what is it? Um, it's promoter, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, their, supposedly their regulator, nuclear <laughs> agency, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but um, NAIS went ahead and actually seated people in the meetings in these towns to get them to cheer for reopening the towns and try and swing the vote. And, and, and there's a lot of um, really uncomfortable clashes between peoples in, in, in their communities. And it, it, it's, there's a high, high level of tension. And isn't it true that there are also citizens 
groups that have started up because of the distrust of the government and of the nuclear industry. Right, there. and that's very unusual in Japan. There's, they've never had anything like this. Yeah. It's always been uh, noted as a conformist society, right? Correct. With uh, everybody agrees and they don't yeah. want to step forward to, uh, to make any kind of scene. But yeah. this, this completely goes against that image. Yes. Um, the the um, anti-nuclear movement is probably about 20% of the population now. And, and in Japan, that's an enormous number. That, I mean, people are confronting their public officials and, and, and hollering at them to let them into meetings. There was a meeting last week uh, where the public showed up. They, they actually were, um, uh, they had done all of the appropriate things to get into the meeting. And when the uh, organizers of the meeting, this was a nuclear um, startup meeting, I believe, when the organizers of the meeting discovered there were so many people from the public there, they said, oh, we can't have you here. We need to move you to a separate room, and we'll let you watch it on television. And that caused a, a ruckus for four hours. So there's still, one year after the accident, the regulators in the Japanese government are still not getting the message that uh, uh, their role is not to promote, their role is to regulate. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so... It's, Maggie, continue. I was just going to say, so people are asking legitimate questions, and they're asking it via petitions, via community meetings, via demonstrations, and they're asking the regulators to respond, and they're not responding. Yeah, and your, the legitimate questions include, what is in my food? Right, what is in my food? Is the air safe to breathe? Is the water safe to drink? I mean, they have contaminated rice, they have contaminated fish, contaminated beef, uh, contaminated green tea. They have a lot of product that has been contaminated, and then the air it is laced with um, hot particles that people can breathe in, and there's also uh, fallout. And fallout, so why don't you explain exactly how fallout works, because I think that's an important part of this discussion. Yep. And it's fallout of, wh of what? Right. Well, after the accident, when the accident first happened, in the first three or four or five days, um, uh, lots of radioactive gases were released, um, things called xenon and krypton, and they're noble gases, and uh, an enormous cloud uh, was over the Fukushima prefecture, the state of Fukushima. Um, that within four days that we were picking up that xenon and, and, and krypton in Seattle, at 40,000 times higher than what it normally is. So there was an enormous amount. Now people breathed that in and then exhaled it and they were in a cloud surrounded by it. And it was also, it's fat soluble, so it enters their, it enters their body. Then after that came the iodine. And um, that's, uh, that's not a gas, but it, um, it, it, went, it aerosolized and it entered kids' um, thyroids. Yeah. And they're finding now that one-third of the kids tested have lumps in their thyroids. One-third of them. And we're not even a, a, a year into the, uh, into the accident. The, the next thing that happened were heavier isotopes called cesium and, and strontium. And they, they fell to the ground. And, and what people are measuring with their little inspector detectors there's predominantly the cesium that's on the ground, that's the fallout that's come down and, and is everywhere. Now it accumulates, water pushes it into trenches and it accumulates on the side of the road. And, uh, um, but it also shows up where kids play. I mean, kids like to kick through leaves and now it's on their shoes and um, on their hands and in their, in their lungs and, and, and... In their uh, children's lungs, where they play, lumps in their, on, their, on their thyroid. And, and I ask a rhetorical question. Why is this information marginalized by the media? I mean, why are we not hearing this? Today, we, we can hear something, but there seems to be almost a conspiracy to to uh, marginalize people who will be concerned about this, and, 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 and including the Japanese people, the mothers and fathers of the children who are so affected, and uh, the children, I believe, are affected more quickly 